This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to the podcast of Man Library's Chats in the Stacks book talk series. Today's talk, originally presented on September 11, 2008, is Turf Work, Telling a Story of Environmental Art. In Telling the Story of Turf Work, a group art project that transformed a green expanse of Cornell's farm research fields into a living work of art, Marsha Ames Sheevely and her students share thoughts on the process of engaging students and drawing on a diversity of strengths for a large-scale collaborative project. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about the project, just telling you a little bit about what we did and how it came about. Then I'm going to pass the microphone down to Flisa, and she's going to give a little bit of her perspective as a student participant in this project. Then we're going to show a film, and then we'll have the main attraction. Sven Callum is the one who, who did the film. He produced the images that you see out of, outside of this room, and he produced the book. Um, and I was, I was a little worried that he might not be able to get here because I would have felt a little bit like a poser doing this uh, without him here since he really produced this work. Um, that having been said, we uh, wrote a, a proposal to the Cornell Council for the Arts last year, and I certainly want to acknowledge them right off the bat for this project. Uh, we and we are, um, we had the support of Marvin Pritz, our chair. We had Frank Rossi involved as a turf grass professor. Ron White is the uh, farm manager out at the Bluegrass Lane facility, and he got excited about this. His, um, there were some uh, technicians who work out at the farm that participated. It seemed as if every step of the way with this project, we had a lot of enthusiasm, and it just kind of kept snowballing. I advertised for a special topics class to pull together students, and the neat thing is I thought if I had eight, it would be like the magic number. And we, in fact, had eight students who were involved in this project. We began the semester by, um, we had a two-part process, and it was a very explicit one. I was as interested in building a cohesive team as in coming up with a design. Someone gave me a really rich piece of advice before um, beginning this project. He said, don't set your course for one destination early on. And if any of you ever have a collaborative process, I'd encourage you to keep those words in mind as well. He said, you don't want to start that first class talking about what it looks like, because you'll, just, you'll cut off too many of the possibilities. So we began the first class talking about what was important to us? What were some of the main themes we might generate? It was along about that time that I realized I'm lousy with a digital camera, and I actually put together an independent study opportunity for a student to uh, document this project, and Sven came along. Fifth year architecture student. Um, he'll talk with you a little bit about his background. But he was, uh, had a unique role in that he was with us, but he was also a bit apart from us, observing, taking photos, documenting this project every step of the way. That's the other thing I'd encourage you to do with a project like this. I think it's a key role, and we learned a lot about the project, reflecting on it through uh, Sven's eyes. So we had the semester. We had the first half of the semester then building a team and engaging in a collaborative design process, first beginning with a big, big ideas, big themes, kind of narrowing that to design elements, and then finally along about the fifth week, actually beginning to talk about what is it going to look like. By then, we were all on the same page. We had a shared vision. We had a shared mission. We actually wrote a mission statement. Rather than get into that, we'll look at that in the book here in a little bit. You can see images of our process. And then um, finally, we had a design, and we started going out to the field. About mid-semester, we started going out to the Bluegrass Lane turf plots, and we began to create the design. Uh, it, I have to say honestly, and, and we'll hear if, hear if I'm being truthful or not, I didn't ever feel that this project was stressful, overwhelming, too much work. You know, there was never a point at which people were sort of nipping at each other's heels. 
it was really pretty amazing. It was a very cohesive group, and I think that came about from the very intentional process of building this team. I had a teaching and learning moment. It was a great moment in history, and I, I mailed a very sappy email to the class about it afterwards because I was so excited about it. We were going to lay out this design um, more than an acre on the field, and I didn't know how we were going to do it. I really didn't. I really discovered that I lack the ability to take something small and imagine it really big. And I was starting to worry about it a little bit. We went out in the van, out to the turf plots. Students fanned out across the field. I looked. They had a sheet with calculations on it. They had measuring tape. They had turf grass paint. They started working, and I said, what do you think I should do? They said, maybe you can stand right over there. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I realized I hadn't nagged. I hadn't said, do you have your calculations? Did you get your supplies? Do you have it together? Have you decided who will play what role? And without any of that, they fanned out across the field. And at the end of the afternoon, you could see this giant design painted on the field. They fell into these different roles. And it was, it was really the highlight of teaching and learning, I think, that I've ever experienced. We worked the rest of the semester, and we pulled together this uh, beautiful piece of artwork, and we celebrated it on Mother's Day. So I think that's all I'm going to say about it. Uh, I think that the images will speak much more loudly than my words. At this point, what I'd like to do is pass the microphone down to Felisa. She'll be talking about her perspective, um, participating in this project, and then we'll see this film that Sven has put together. Sure. Um, as Marcia said, I'm Felisa Stevenson. I was one of the students who helped build TurfWorks. And I actually graduated in landscape architecture here from Cornell in 2003. So I had some experience technically with the type of project we were undertaking. But never, even in our landscape architecture work, had we done such a large design build experience. I mean, most of the things we do are very theoretical and very small scale. <laughs> so this was a great challenge. And I think from, from my perspective, with Marsha putting out the call for this special topics course, it was like answering a challenge. Um, I think for me as a student, even going through a very applied practice of landscape architecture here at Cornell, that you still hunger to really put your hands deep into something and create something that you can actually stand back and say, I made that. And so that, I thought, was, at least for myself, and I saw some of that glimmer in the rest of the students who stepped up and, and really participated. And we, all through the process, were eager to just get going. We were so eager to see it happen. Um, Marcia's process, I thought, that she sort of allowed us to move through gracefully, was really freeing. Um, as she said, she didn't sort of... Uh, set any rigid guidelines, but she did give us advice and guidance along the way to help us self-organize. And I think because we all came together with this sort of self-selected strong intention to create something, and of course we didn't know what we were going to create at the time, <laughs> but uh, moving through that process was really a great time and it was an amazing collaborative experience because just at those tension points where you think you're not going to get over this hurdle, and it was never really big. You just feel the tension when differences of opinion come together and they're sort of colliding and pushing each other. Then something happened to just sort of expand that out. And I, I can't quite explain it, but it, it just happened. Because I think, once again, the overriding intention of everyone in the class was to make something. And so you were willing to surrender that aspect of make it my way. Um, in, in terms of that tension, and to get to the point of creating something that we all could say, this is what we made. Um, and I think that was really exciting. And the scale, um, that was the other thing I thought, it certainly drew me to the project, because once again, small scale, medium scale, huge scale, <laughs> more than an acre. And to actually say that you're going to get out there and make that yourself. It's not someone else going to be assigned to do the contracting work or anything. So, um, and then in the making process, the real satisfaction and the bigger challenge came in is because some of the initial plans and material that we intended to use just didn't work out, just like in real life. When you get out there and you go, okay, we're going to use this, and we can't because it's going to take too much time, 
It's not very ecologically friendly. You know, so we really pulled back, and as a group, we were able to make some quick on-the-ground decisions um, pretty fast and very creatively to get the project done. And once again, Marsha was standing back there, and I have to tell you, I think Marsha was actually a little more tense than the rest of us. We were fine. She was like, oh, my God, <laughs> what are we going to do? And, you know, she was very calm about it, but you could just see, like, you know, her hairs were starting to fry. <laughs> But, you know, we were like, okay, we can do this, you know, no problem. And each of us had um, a certain type of talent to contribute. So it was amazing because within eight people, you had a certain amount of um, radical creativity, technical competence, and, and brute physical strength. <laughs> and it all came together to really make the project uh, an enjoyable process in the making, but also... Um, the experience of collaboration, which oftentimes can be very painful, <laughs> to say the least, but this actually was a very unique uh, and enjoyful, enjoyment experience. So, I do want to mention another key player. In fact, I was looking to see if he may have come. He was going to see if he could sneak out of, uh, of his work. Jeff DeCastro is a local earth artist, and he wasn't with us for every session, but he came to an initial session, and he came at several points. And he, I thought, brought a broader vision for what we could do. He pointed us toward a number of resources, had the students review other Earth artists and what they had done. And I think he served as a, both an inspiration and someone who could make us think a little bit bigger than perhaps we may have. So he isn't here today, but he was a, a key figure in this whole process. So what I'd like to do now is just pause, and I think we have to get this set up, and it might take about 30 seconds here. Then we'll show the film and turn this mic over to Sven.
I pretty much um, broke down uh, the book into, into those two phases, one um, being the design phase and the second part actually being the construction phase. Um, uh, and I, I wasn't shooting any video um, of the actual design. Um, it, while it is very important to, um, to the process of making, making anything, um, really, it, it's also, it's also a, tends to be a little bit more dry, maybe. Um, there's a lot of conversation, a lot of talking, um, and a lot more dialogue than, um, than you'll see in the, in the film, where you know, people are moving around, um, and there's a lot more activity actually um, going on. Um, I don't know if so. Uh, when uh, when Marsha was um, she sent out the email um, looking for somebody to document this whole thing. Um, I received the email and um, I was actually um, it worked out well for me because I was taking actually taking a photography class um, at Cornell. So I was already all set up to you know be taking photos, so it was sort of a nice um, addition to you know the courses that I was taking. So I was taking the photography class, and I was uh, working on this on this project, um, taking photos. And um, I should note that um, the tendency nowadays is to, if if you're documenting uh, any sort of sculpture or any work, um, people will be uh, Using digital cameras, and um, I actually decided to to do all of this using film, um, black and white film, in in conjunction with uh, the photo class that I was taking. Um, so all of the images in there and all of the photos out there are all um, they're all analog uh, photography. Um, what I did to actually make the book um, was to just scan the negatives um, and fix any blemishes that were um, on the images, and then um, compile the book uh, in that format. Um, it, the, whole, the whole process of um, uh, post-production, I think, is, is um, it's sort of like everybody has already um, left and departed, and um, you're sort of in the role of, of um, you know, now, now that the project is compute, complete, you have all of these images, all this, this video footage, you have to kind of um, begin filtering and um, editing and cutting, cutting everything. Um, and it's, 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 a, I guess it's a very tedious process, a very um, long process. Um, I spent the most of uh, the summer, actually, after the project was complete, finishing um, editing the book, finishing the book, um, putting it together um, so that it could be printed, um, and then also printing all of the images, which um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, analog uh, printing techniques for, for film photography. It, it, it's a very time-consuming process. Um, so by the end of the summer, I had you know completed all of these different um, mediums for um, uh, preserving um, the project that we had done. And that's, um, I think, a very uh, important thing to, to keep in mind is that um, everything that I was making is sort of um, uh, a preservation of the project that we were doing because we all knew it was a temporary, um, temporary installation. So at this point, it's probably not even there anymore. Um, and the role that you know, what I what I was doing was basically um, tr preserving um, that the project through film and through photography, um, and that um, the post production is sort of um, a filtering out and compilation of all of those uh, of of the design process of of um, the process of actually taking all of the photos that I and the footage. A film that I that, that I was taking when when I initially um, took on like the role that I was in, um, I definitely had a very open mind to it, um, and the the aim that I had sort of developed as the project was developing. Um, so initially, I was definitely just sort of trying to get 
um, as many shots and as many angles and views as possible, um, which um, you know led to a large library um, that I was looking over as time um, went on. Um, and as the project developed, um, I definitely had um, uh, some views or some uh, ideas for uh, what I wanted to do or like, how I wanted to take the photos. Um, so for example, um, it wasn't really until uh, we got outside that um, I realized that you know there's a lot of uh, so the photos that I was taking while I was in the classroom versus the photos that I was taking um, while we were actually working outside are, are I mean dramatically different just in terms of um, the the setting that we were in you know I was sort of confined with all the students um, and I didn't have much uh, room to move around um, so the photos all tend to be um, a lot more uh, sort of intimate, I guess, um, because I was um, always sort of uh, there with the students um, uh, taking photos and things like that. Um, and once uh, we got outside, you know, I had a lot more freedom to sort of, um, uh, just as far as the composition of the, the photos, um, just sort of uh, get larger views, larger angles and things like that. Um, which um, I think led to a lot of different uh, interesting uh, photos that, that I think you can see in the book. Um, uh, once I got outside, I think it really, uh, there was a lot more creative freedom, I think, in the way that I was taking the photos. That's not to say that the photos I was taking inside weren't, aren't uh, nice or creative or, or interesting compositionally or anything like that. Um, but once I got outside, you know, I was really able to um, uh, think about, um, you know, how the people are interacting with the environment, like the actual landscape, um, looking at the different materials that, were, that we were using, um, just trying to um, uh, get different views, um, which is also, uh, very important, I think. Um, um, I don't know if I don't know if the, everybody has had a chance to look through the book or looked at the photos outside, but um, I mean, we had a small uh, lift outside that I was using to try and take some photos, um, you know, slightly like from 20 feet in the air. Um, then I was taking photos um, again, more intimate photos. Um, I was taking photos where I was just sort of walking around. Um, and eventually it sort of culminated in being able to take photos from an airplane, which, um, you know, the, the view is drastically different um, than what you're seeing um, from the ground where, um, so like from the air, you're able to sort of see um, the project um, or the sculpture holistically um, versus when you're on the ground um, and even 20 feet in the air, um, it's sort of difficult to grasp. It was difficult to grasp, like, the actual size of the project. Um, and I think the, those different views um, uh, and the photos that I was taking sort of uh, lead to different, um, different ways I think that the sculpture could be read as, as you're actually experiencing it. Um, yeah. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.